This is a joint collaboration with faculty from McMaster University and the University of Calgary. In this video, we'll be going over the technique for using ultrasound to assess the jugular venous pulse, or the JVP. We have no disclosures to declare. As internal medicine physicians, many of us already examine the internal jugular vein commonly, if not daily, at the bedside. The highest point of its pulsation is measured and is used to approximate the right atrial pressure. If we already do this daily, why do we need to use ultrasound? As it turns out, despite optimal positioning and physical examination technique, or perhaps because in order to see it, the vein's pulsations need to be transmitted through the overlines of cutaneous tissue. Inability to visualize the JVP has been reported to range anywhere between 16 to 80 percent of patients. And in these cases, ultrasound can be quite helpful. Let's start with a quick refresher on the relevant anatomy and features. Wherever possible, we examine the right internal jugular vein. This is commonly located lateral to the carotid artery and the thyroid lobe. Its physical examination features you should already be familiar with, such as its location between the two heads of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. It has a double waveform, should not be palpable, it should be occludable, and its height changes with respiration and patient positioning and it rises with abdominal jugular reflux. And many of these features can also be demonstrated using ultrasound. To do the examination, you'll need a high frequency linear array transducer, generally greater than five megahertz. With the transducer marker pointing to the patient's right, scan up and down the vein. By keeping the vein in the center of the screen, you can determine the direction that the vein takes. The ultrasound image looks something like this. The near field or top of the screen is the anterior aspect of the patient. The far field is the posterior. And as the transducer marker is pointing to the patient's right, which corresponds to the dot on the screen here, the screen left will correspond to the patient's right, while the screen right will be the patient's left, or close to the patient's midline. This image is similar to the way CT scans are cut, as if we're looking up into the patient from the patient's feet. Anatomy-wise, anteriorly, you will see the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Near the midline, you can see the patient's right thyroid lobe, Lateral to that is the right common carotid artery. And lateral to that should be the right internal jugular vein. You can confirm some of its features using ultrasound. For example, you can observe that it collapses or gets smaller during patient's inspiration. And if you apply pressure from the transducer, you can see that the internal jugular vein is compressible, while the carotid artery much less so. And if you ask the patient to perform a Valsalva maneuver, it should distend. In addition, adjusting the height of the bed will also result in a change in its size. And for those who are familiar with Doppler functions, you can use spectral Doppler to see its waveform. Here is a tracings from an internal jugular vein. You can see the double waveforms. Whereas applying spectral Doppler to the carotid artery in this example here will demonstrate the presence of arterial waveforms. While multiple approaches to examining the JVP using ultrasound have been published, this video will go over one technique that was described in the Annals of Internal Medicine 
in 2022. We find this technique relatively easy to learn for the average learner, and it correlates directly with what clinicians are already doing at the bedside when they examine the JVP using physical examination technique. To do the examination, elevate the head of the bed between 30 and 45 degrees. Have the patient position their head slightly leftward in a neutral position. Place the transducer above the clavicle. Identify the internal jugular vein and follow this cranially until it tapers smaller than the common carotid artery throughout the respiratory cycle. It's at this point that you're going to measure the level in centimeter above sternal angle. You then add five centimeter to this. For example, if the IJ is tapering at two centimeter above sternal angle, the JVP is seven centimeter of water pressure. Values greater than three centimeter above sternal angle or eight centimeter of water are considered abnormal. Be sure that the transducer is parallel to the floor and not tilted as shown in this picture here. If the internal jugular vein is not seen in this initial exam, lower the bed to 30 degrees and have the patient perform a spouse self maneuver to confirm its anatomical location. In these cases, it's considered zero centimeter above sternal angle and therefore adding five centimeter to this will result in a five centimeter water pressure. The JVP measured using this method seen in the, y, in the X axis on the graph suggests that its measurements correlate closely with the right atrial pressure that were measured using cardiac catheterization seen on the Y axis here. The correlation coefficient was reported to be 0.79. The receiving operating characteristics curve shows an area under the curve of 0.84 with an optimal cutoff defined at 8 cm or 3 cm above sternal angle. A second method described in this paper is a qualitative approach whereby the patient sitting in the upright 90 degree position, knees flexed, feet on the floor. Alternatively, you can have the legs extended on the bed but otherwise have the patient be sitting in the upright position. The transducer is placed at the base of the neck, just above the clavicle and parallel to the floor. This examination is considered positive if the IJ is at least the same size as the adjacent carotid artery and not collapsed throughout the respiratory cycle. A positive test is highly specific for predicting an elevated right atrial pressure of 10 millimeter mercury or greater, but it's relatively low in sensitivity. Additional findings from the study suggest that the accuracy of both physical examination and the ultrasound examination technique is lower in patients with elevated BMI. So now that you know how to examine the JVP using ultrasound, let's go over some pearls. First, be aware that the IJ can be full and round, so don't mistake this for the carotid. In addition, anatomy can be quite variable. Here, the carotid is underneath the internal jugular vein and not medial to it. So use as many ways to confirm that it's in the, in the um, internal jugular vein that you're looking at before you start to measure it. As you know, the IJ is compressible and the carotid is less so. And what that means is that at any given cross-sectional level, you can compress to make the IJ smaller than the carotid. So don't compress. In fact, actively lighten the pressure on the IJ to a point of just losing contact with the skin. If the IJ enlarges during this process, you know you have applied too much pressure. In this example here, the transducer pressure is being lifted. And as you do this, you can see that the IJ is increasing in, in its size. 
So if you see that, you recognize that this was not indeed the taper point, rather that this small ij is induced by excessive transducer pressure. The true taper point is likely higher. Here's an example where lifting the transducer did not result in an increase in the size of the ij, and therefore giving you some reassurance that the small ij that was seen was not artificially induced by excessive transducer pressure from the operator. Next tip, don't rotate. The diameter may falsely be large when it's rotated. Lastly, ensure that your transducer is parallel to the ground. Otherwise, tilting inferiorly, you will be evaluating a lower portion of the IJ. This will be falsely large. Whereas, if you're tilting superiorly, you'll be evaluating the superior portion of the IJ, which would be falsely small. So keep your transducer parallel to the ground, like so. These are the take-home messages. Ultrasound can be useful when the IJ cannot be seen on physical examination. Use a number of maneuvers to differentiate between the carotid and the internal jugular vein. Its location, compressibility, response to valsalva, abdominal jugular reflux, respiratory variations, and patient positioning. Image the vein in a transverse view, slide cranially until it tapers smaller than the common carotid artery throughout the respiratory cycle. Do watch your technique though. Don't compress, don't rotate, don't tilt, and keep your transducer parallel to the ground. On behalf of my co-authors, thank you for watching. Please contact us if you have any questions.